All right, welcome everybody. God bless you. Glad you're back. This is lesson three of our 10 part series on the Russian New Martyrs and the Catacomb Church. This is the Orthodox Ethos channel for all of you newcomers. My name is Father Peter Hears, and this is going to be dedicated tonight in this lesson to the <clears throat> question of renovationism, the renovationist, the living church, and the various movements that made up renovationism. We're going to talk about that tonight, what that means and what it means for us today, because it is not at all something, a thing of the past. We have it today with us. In fact, I would venture to say we might have a worse version, a more perverse and deceptive version, a more uh, a version that has more of official dumb associated with it than even back in the day. Uh, things were perhaps clear in the 1920s in Russia. So we're going to learn about the past of how it started. We're going to learn about the people that made it up uh, and led it. We're going to learn about the events that brought them to power for a span of a few years and, uh, and how the Soviets manipulated it. We're going to learn about the Orthodox response but we're gonna probably go through tonight and half of next week's lesson on this topic. So next week's lesson is um, normal, would normally, or will deal with this topic, the satanic Bolshevik mentality methodology, but we're gonna probably take up the first half an hour at least talking more about the orthodox response to renovations. So tonight we're gonna to be focusing mostly on what it is, what it's about, what it thinks, how it works as a movement and as an idea. So let's get started with our prayers, as always, and our Triparian to the, to the uh, uh, Holy Trinity, which is from the Feast of Pentecost, which is what we always start with, calling upon the enlightenment of God on our work. So let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teaching. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments. That trample down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, our holy good and life, creating spirit, will now endeavor unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Tu salis sana dixas, kata pemsas aftis to pnevma, to agion kedi afton, tiniku menis aginemsas, filantrope, Amen. All right. Let's get right into it. We got a lot to cover as always. We pack these discussions full. Got a good house uh, crowd tonight as always. Thanks be to God. Glad to have you all with us. So we are, as we said, third lesson yesterday. In Russia, as we see, perhaps today in America, it looks like the spirit is not that different. Renovationists and the Orthodox response. We're going to look first just briefly at the prehistory. Where did they come from, these renovationists? Why did they exist and why were they ready to uh, seek power, attain power through the Soviet uh, mechanisms? This image you have here on screen is from the 1905 uh, massacre and also the attempt at a revolution. 
that's a long story we're not going to get into, but it does have its roots there. And even before that, uh, it is connected. So from whence cometh the renovationists? Well, there's a clear continuity in terms of agenda and outlook between the renovationist movement, 1923, 26 especially, and the church renewal, quote unquote, renewal movement of 1900 or thereabouts and up until the revolution. There's a continuity of ideas with the pre-revolutionary church intelligentsia, the intellectuals. And that would be those who were portions of the uh, of the intellectuals who were apostates and came back during the first two decades of the 20th century, came back to the Orthodox Church, but brought baggage with them. Such thinkers as Berdayev and Bogakov would definitely be in this category. And their ideas about church reform and church life. Uh, and it's always a mixed bag. There's always the spirit of Python. There's always uh, truth. There's, bits of it at least, uh, the the human person always brings something to the table that, that reflects his uh, divine uh, image. So it's never all bad, but the question is, is it inspired by God? Is it something that God inspired man? And is it a synergy or is it simply the clay, the, the, the bits and pieces of, of dirt that man offers up from his own intellect? The renovation has participated in social and political movements. For instance, the group of 32, 32 priests of the 1905 revolution and the League and Democratic Clergy and Laymen of Democratic Clergy and Laymen, which would be around the time of the revolution which formed. A lot of these same people are then involved in the uh, renovationist movement in 1922, 1923 and onward. There were two concerns that were predominant. For the most part, there are other concerns and a lot of worldliness, but there is some liter liter uh, somewhat more legitimate concerns that they had been raising and raised. Liturgical reform would be one of them. I'm not calling that too, it's not what I would call that legitimate, but in any case, uh, something that had a veneer of legitimacy and spiritual revival for social transformation and justice. This will be something very important. We're going to analyze that a little bit tonight. What is this social transformation and justice? What is it all about? And does it remind us anything of the social justice warriors in America today? The cause, the rights of the white, in other words, the non-monastic parish clergy. So this was a big part of some of the leading renovationists, as the one you see here in the picture. This was his agenda, which was, the black, quote unquote, black clergy, that is the monastic clergy, the bishops for the most part, the other, and maybe perhaps the, the abbots, but mainly the bishops, they have too much power. And they have too much power. We need to we need to take power into our own hands as parish clergy. And there was a lot of resentment on the part of the married clergy in the parishes, uh, who were many of them in uh, impoverishment and in difficult situations and didn't have much of a say at all uh, beyond uh, some limited uh, authority in their parish. They were working for political, social, and economic reforms relating the gospel to issues of social justice. Again, that's something you'll see repeated again and again. It's something we'll <clears throat> look at because it's important for us today. And again, <clears throat> Uh, it's important to realize that there were a variety of movements going on, different people, different agendas, different uh, uh, ambitions. Uh, it wasn't a uh, monolithic movement at all. Uh, there were disparate movements held together by as uh, one of our, our sources. Um, by the way, for those who are in Patreon, we'll be listing our sources there. We didn't have time to get all that together tonight. but. We have a number of sources from very uh, well-researched articles over the last couple of decades that we've been pulling from for all of this material tonight, and that'll be listed for those who are in Patreon. Uh, and we can list it also in the, in the show notes below, not a problem. There were disparate movements held together by a dialectical understanding of social evolution 
which welcomed the new socialist state as embodying essentially Christian ideas. Now, this is something that kind of jumped off the page at me, having now in hindsight, looking back and seeing the destruction that came with communism and socialism, just how idealistic and how how positive a lot of a lot of these priests and bishops were toward the socialists, the communists, the Bolsheviks, uh, even as they witnessed them slaughter Christians. Now we we saw in the last two sessions that from the get get go from the outset we have almost immediately we have priests and clergy and lay people getting slaughtered, killed, martyred. Uh, and that doesn't stop at all, and it increases, of course, after the uh, 19, 1926, 27, 28. Things only get worse all the way through the 30s. But it's just uh, rather amazing the uh, stance of these renovationists who will, of course, become uh, willing uh, co-workers with the communists uh, to, to, to uh, upend the church uh, but they they had bought into the idea that what the communists were about, what the socialists were about, was actually Christian. It was a Christian uh, ideals, uh, Christian ideas that they were trying to achieve. And that shows you the worldliness of Christians at the time. Because, of course, the end goal, obviously, is not the end. It's not the same. The methods are not the same. The ethos is not the same as the Christian uh, in terms of uh, trying to bring about a, a just and, and equitable society. The things are going to be quite different in the way that Orthodox go about it. So that's rather shocking. But it shouldn't, uh, it should be very, I think, didactic for us. Because look, we have plenty of those kind of mindsets and people in the Orthodox Church today who are identifying with the social justice movements of the day and calling them, essentially identifying with them and calling them somehow uh, akin to the Christian outlook. Uh, who are these renovationists? Who are these renovationists? Let's talk about them. I think it's important to understand a little bit of the biography. We don't have a lot of information on all of these leaders, but we do have enough to get a good sense. This is one of the main uh, protagonists uh, leaders of the uh, innovationists. He's a bishop. He was uh, in Moscow. I think he had a one of the smaller dioceses or Voithos, I uh, say a, a titular bishop. I'm not really sure exactly, uh, but he was well known for his um, outspoken criticism of the establishment going back quite a number of years. So this is not a surprise. And he, he became the main Episcopal leader uh, of the renovations. He was a dissident, a reformer, even before the revolution. He had a charisma and an authority which projected him to be the most notable figure, the front man of the movement uh, for the renovations, for the most part, at least for the, in the beginning. He had a reputation. This is Bishop Antonin Granovsky. I didn't say his name. Antonina, Antonin, yeah. I, I don't know why they don't translate Ant Anthony, but that's, uh, they keep, in many of these translations, they keep the, the, the Russian uh, approach and, and, and uh, pronunciation. And <clears throat> he had a reputation for instability, even madness, one said. An unquiet, unstable personality lacking real links with Orthodox tradition. Now, that's one version. Other people had a positive view of him, as we'll see. But one thing that's important here, I don't think, is his personality traits, but his lack of real links with Orthodox tradition. That's what's important. And that's what a lot of these um, secular or worldly critics or, or, or historians miss because they don't have the criteria to see exactly well, does he, how connected is he to the Orthodox tradition, Orthodox roots? Uh, and I think that's an important, the most important criteria of all. He, he his admirers praised him and his great learning, deep insight into hypocrisy and falsehood, 
and unswerving devotion to seeking the truth. Now, these are characteristics that are, of course, praiseworthy. But it's interesting, the characteristics, you'll see that in the, in the first three or four people here that we're going to talk about, the characteristics are not something all that unique to Orthodox Christian spiritual life. Um, something that you could be a non-Orthodox Christian and have. You could have a great deal of learning. You could uh, despise uh, hypocrisy and falsehood. Uh, and you could have a, a devotion to seeking the truth. Uh, that's not something that's all that unique to being an Orthodox Christian. Of course, it's not a, it's good good things, but not necessarily something that you need to be an Orthodox Christian to have. He is said to have stood for the purest and most idealistic aspirations in renovationism, aiming for the, quote, moral improvement and overall reformation of society. Again, this is uh, what we'd say in Greek, exostrephia, turned to the outward, right? This is what characteristic of all these renovationists is that their focus and their, and their agenda is in the social sphere. Uh, orthodoxy for them seems to be, a good deal of it seems to be about the uh, community, communal life, social life. And that's where they want to see things lived out. They want to see things change. And so they're focusing outward, focusing on others. And that's characteristic of a renovationist today as well, I think. His slogan was the communization of life. Uh, he, did, he did use this term before communism came to power. So it's not necessarily reflective of him being a communist. But it's interesting the, the term does uh, identify with the spirit of the day. The free unity of free individuals of redeemed, uh, who are redeemed by the blood of Christ is how he put it. Uh, he welcomed the revolution, but rejected its methods in militant atheism. Now, that's interesting. He welcomed the revolution. Would any Orthodox Christian have welcomed the revolution? A bishop of all. But there is a segment of the church that did welcome the revolution, which is kind of mind-boggling for us today, I think. Uh, looking back at what that meant, and what, what, what destruction came in its wake. Uh, now, there was obviously a lot of cynicism and a lot of pressure going back decades and decades for the Russian people to throw off the so-called uh, uh, backwardness and reactionary stance that the church was maintaining and what they were accused of by the people like the Bolsheviks. And so I'm, my guess here is there had been a lot of work done uh, for decades and decades. If we go back decades, you can hear St. John of Kronstadt, as we heard two, two weeks ago, calling upon the repentance of all the people, especially the intellectuals. So there was a, there was a, uh, a lot of uh, work being done on the people and the leaders to embrace uh, the Western views, the non-Orthodox, the heterodox, the, the worldly uh, uh, idealistic political approach to life and society. Uh, so that just shows you a little bit how far gone we are by the time we get to 1970. And he, uh, he welcomed the revolution, but rejected its methods, as we said, and, and militant atheism. Of course, he's going to reject atheism. That goes without saying, uh, and the methods. But the revolution itself, again, is a, is a bit sh striking that he would welcome the overthrow of the Tsar. He strove for practical reforms in the liturgy, Russian instead of Slavonic, participation of the congregation in the liturgy, celebration of the liturgy in the middle of the congregation. The main chronicle of, uh, chronicler of the renovationists, who we're going to hear from quite a bit tonight, Anatoly Levitin Krasnov, they usually refer to him as Levitin, Levitin, I don't know how you say that in Russian, finds all of Antonin's proposals later embodied, very interestingly, in the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. So that gives you a sense of the spirit here and the identity. I think it's very interesting that this main uh, historian of the renovationists, who was himself a renovationist, uh, at least participated for a time as a deacon, uh, in those uh, churches, uh, we'll see at the end about that, uh, identifies the, one of the main leaders of renovations with the Second Vatican Council. It's very interesting and very instructive. 
And of course, it's very interesting and instructive that today we have uh, a massive renovationism. We're going to talk about this a little bit later uh, in the Orthodox Church. Again, identifying with the Second, Second Vatican Council. Uh, again, the centers of renovationism in the church uh, uh, trying to imitate and 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 and, and uh, is praising the Second Vatican Council and going about with their own version of that in Crete a few years ago. So this is a uh, this is not at all. Um, an accident, and uh, it's it's very interesting. I think very interesting, very instructive. Now, this is uh, Alexander Iv Ivanovich Vedensky, if I'm saying it correctly. He is probably the figure most associated with the Living Church renovationism. His face, his person, because he led it the longest, all the way till its demise in, uh, in the late, uh, well, all the way up into the late 30s, early 40s, uh, when it finally was essentially uh, absorbed and put away uh, by the communists. And uh, he took over, uh, essentially, the movement uh, a few years after its, uh, its uh, origins, after its beginning. And so he is the most, most identified, I think, in the whole Soviet era with renovationism. Now, he's an interesting figure. Uh, but not that surprising that he would be a leader in renovationism. He's a Jewish convert. I think his mother was Jewish, if I remember correctly, uh, and an intellectual and uh, a frequenter of the salons where all these uh, discussions were going about uh, in imitation of following after the example of the Western French uh, intellectual circles. He was a, a married priest. He actually married twice <laughs> and became a metropolitan, so, so called in the renovationist movement. And he had five children. Uh, he was from Novgorod initially, but he was uh, educated in St. Petersburg. He initially rejected ordination because of his intellectualism and they, they didn't trust his origins. Uh, and in 1914, he was finally ordained uh, after being initially rejected in St. Petersburg. After the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, Vizelensky who always saw himself as an apologist and a reformer of the church. So right from the beginning, he said, this is my agenda. This is what I'm about. I'm going to bring reform to the Orthodox Church. That's always a very bad sign. When people are coming and they feel that their job is to change the church as, a, as opposed to be changed by it, uh, that their job is to somehow improve on the holy tradition as opposed to become a conveyor and continuer of the holy tradition, well, we know things aren't going to end well, and we have plenty of those today as well, who think that the church needs to be improved upon, changed, as opposed to uh, we need to be grafted into the holy tradition that comes down to us. Uh, he joined the reformist elements of the Church of Russia and maintained good relations with the Soviet government, of course, from the beginning. He presided over a group of, uh, called the Union of Communities of Ancient Apostolic Churches. Sounds like uh, some kind of Vaganti bishop or something uh, that is not in communion with the Orthodox Church. Something created perhaps by heterodox groups, but he was actually a priest in the Orthodox Church, but obviously didn't have connection with the saints of his day. Uh, in 1922, at the time of the coup, which he was a part of, that is taking over of the Orthodox Church by the renovationist. When St. Tikhon was under house arrest, he joined with Father Vladimir Kranitsky, who we're going to talk about next, and his living church, and eventually became known as his leader. So he wasn't actually the leader of the living church to begin with. Some people say the living church, they mean the renovationist, but actually the living church was one of several movements. There were three different movements that, main movements, there were more actually, that formed uh, the renovationist from the beginning, three different leaders with different uh, agendas, but similar agendas. But eventually he, although he wasn't initially a part of it or leading it, he became a part of the church and then he took it over essentially afterwards uh, and became its uh, figurehead. This next figure is very important at the origins, although he'll quickly uh, disappear from the scene, but he's very important at the very origins. You'll see his, his, uh, his uh, boldness and uh, politically minded uh, 
maneuvering is going to be very important for them to to work with the Bolsheviks and get power and and essentially take over the Orthodox Church for for a time in Russia. Uh, Vladimir Dmitri Dmitrievich Krasnitsky. This is the single-minded champion of the rights of the white parish clergy. Unlike other renovationist leaders, he had no record of being a dissident. He's actually he was actually involved in the far right. So he uh, he went from one extreme to another. And this is what people remember and understood uh, about him pretty early, that he was a careerist. And there were quite a few involved in the renovationists that were. And that's not unlike our own days either, either is it? Because people who are interested in climbing the ladder, getting a position, uh, becoming a professor, uh, you know, ha having their papers published, uh, having uh, becoming a bishop. We have the phenomenon of the Archimandrites of theology, the people who never spent a day in the monastery, uh, they got their PhD or master's, and then they go immediately looking for a bishopric. Uh, this is the kind of sickness that leads to a renovationist, right? And then, so that that's a big part of the renovationist, that the people involved were looking for some kind of glory or some kind of position or some kind of, they had some kind of agenda. They had a lot of ambition, a lot of ambition. And so he was, as I said, a chaplain of the Black Hundred Union of Russian People, which is an arch conservative group. But he became the leader of the Living Church, the faction of renovationists, whose writings were combative and meant to identify the enemy and rally the loyalists. It's reminiscent of secular revolutionary propaganda. So you can imagine the ethos there, right? The ethos is just totally foreign to the Orthodox way. <clears throat> Levitin, the historian of the renovationists, saw him as a willing instrument in the hands of the GPU. The GPU is the Secret Service police, uh, people in charge essentially of taking and manipulating and destroying the church. And yet someone who, when his career came abruptly to an end, did not denounce his faith, but struggled as a, as a uh, cemetery, that should be cemetery chaplain. So there is something interesting here, and I and I intentionally put these different aspects and uh, characteristics of these people before us, because I don't want you to think, and it's easy to do that. It's easy, and it, there's an inclination even when I was doing the research to do that, and it's wrong, and that is to vilify and demonize the people. Now, the, that's not how it is, though, right? It's not all black. It's not all white. It's 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 sinful, passionate people. And, and the reason why it's important to recognize that is that if you don't understand that well-meaning, deluded people are what lead the movements like the renovationists, and they're not uh, from outer, outer space or Mars, but they're actually people just, just like you and I who are struggling, but are not struggling well in this faith and not, not ma maintaining <clears throat> the right stance spiritually. And they fall into delusion. They fall into worldliness. Uh, that they're they're not far from all of us, and from many of the people we know in the church today. So that's what's imp it's important for us to realize that that he had there were redemptive qualities. Of course, these were not. It's very easy to demonize and to just uh, say, well, these these terrible, awful, uh, evil men, uh, and be done with it. But I don't think that's actually true. It's not accurate. It's not the way things work. In real life, so he had that, and he was praised by Levitin, the the historian, for that faithfulness. Even though they recognized that he was ambitious, he was a careerist, he wanted to. Do this, still, they recognized that he believed on some level. He had some kind of faith. He didn't get up and walk away, but remained a, uh, a cemetery chaplain. And probably lived a very difficult life, uh, I would guess, going forward, or at least a not a very glamorous, glamorous uh, life. Uh, so Levitin also saw Krasnitsky in favor of abolishing the episcopate altogether. He wanted the priest and the deacon and nothing else. That's enough. And as this was impossible, he chose instead to replace monastic bishops with married bishops who owed their careers to him, and he compelled uh, and, and so they, they were compelled to stay loyal to the living church. So it was a way to ensure 
that both his agenda was going to be accomplished. He wanted married priests, bishops, married priests to become bishops. And if they were beholden to him for their bishopric, then he would control, uh, can keep things in control. It's interesting. His stance was so severe that Antonin, who was one of the leaders and his co-worker, uh, eventually got sidelined through this man who also had ascended the uh, had ascended the the power uh, pyramid of the renovationists. Uh, so uh, he was consistent, at least, in his rejection of the monastic bishops, even if one of them was his co-worker and uh, leader. Now, those are some of the lesser or the well-known but lesser. Uh, on the totem pole of hierarchy in the Orthodox Church, those figures, they were the most active and uh, the initiates, as we'll see in the renovationist movement. But there were bishops who also joined. And here are the probably most, some of the most notable bishops. Of course, Metropolitan Sergius uh, of Novgorod, who will go on to become uh or make himself with his small group of bishops into the patriarch of all Russia uh, in 1945, 46. But at the time he was uh, the Metropolitan of Novgorod and he had two bishops with him, Serafim and Evdokimov, or Evdokim, if I'm, maybe I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be Evdokimov, or if that's supposed to be uh, Evdokimos in Greek, it's a, it, it's a, I'm going to try to try to stay with the Russian pronunciation if I can. Um, and the, these three bishops became enthusiastic supporters of renovationism. In fact, Archbishop Evdokim remained with it until his repose. He was a missionary in Canada, actually. Interesting for those who are in Canada and America. Uh, you can go online and find a very detailed biography in English about his whole life and his work in America and his, uh, his, his enthusiastic embrace, unfortunately, of renovationism, uh, which is a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But <clears throat> these are some of the most well-known bishops and supporters of renovationism on the Episcopal plane. Now, Bishop uh, Sergius, we'll talk about him, of course, quite a bit in the next couple of sessions, but it is really important to understand that he left and embraced the renovations, even though he was well known as a uh, erudite and learned bishop, uh, praised for his knowledge of the canons and church history, uh, and yet he embraces this 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 movement, which in hindsight at least, seems rather worldly and rather uh, unbelievable that someone of his uh, stature would have embraced. This was all, of course, with the blessing and the uh, serious involvement of the uh, police state and the Communist Party. And the main person who was going to be manipulating and working to bring all this about is the man you see here. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher these words, so forgive me if you're a Russian speaker. Uh, Tukov, Tuk, Tuchkov, I don't know how you, how you would pronounce that. And he was the go-between. He was the man that was charged with bringing about division in the Orthodox Church and sowing division as much as possible. And so he would be going back and forth and, in fact, actually working closely with the renovationists. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's, the, that his, that's his group of uh, co-workers behind him. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Soviet agenda because it's important to understand how they're going to manipulate the church and manipulate the, the, the renovationists to bring this about. Uh, so we're talking about 1922. They've been going back and forth debating Trotsky and Lenin and others. What's the best way to annihilate the church? What's the best way to manipulate them? How do we get rid of religion in the, in, in, in the Soviet Union as quickly as possible? And there were basically two approaches. One which would be long-term, positive, uh, alluring people away from the church with uh, pleasure and uh, cinema and, and all kinds of uh, distractions. 
uh, and propaganda and, and not outright persecution. Uh, that would be the cultural maybe uh, version. And then there would be the administrative version, which was outright persecution and and restrictive laws and, and just a, a brutal uh, repression of the Orthodox Church. And they used both of them. Uh, this uh, particular moment, because there was some concern that if they were only using one or the other, they would they needed to use both, but they would they were overextending perhaps with the administrative repression of the church. And so now there was a time when they said, well, let's entertain the idea of they never wanted to recognize any religion or or, or give any kind of credence to religion at all. Uh, but they ended up doing it in order to split the Orthodox Church and to have a leadership that was totally uh, something they could manipulate. Uh, so while there's no place for religion in the socialism, concessions could at the moment be made to religious believers who were opposed to the, pro, the pre-revolutionary established, quote-unquote, feudal, old-fashioned ecclesiastical order. The government could justify making concessions for the moment to Protestant denominations, right, because that would undermine the Orthodox Church, and in the same way, it could condone the appearance of Protestants, the renovationists, essentially like Protestants, within the Orthodox Church. So that's what's going on here. It's a, it's a temporary thing, and, it, and it's very interesting that it didn't last very long until they, they, they allowed uh, Patriot Tikkun to come back because they wanted, they wanted to create division. They didn't want one or the other to totally have power over the church. They wanted to have chaos and division. They also wanted to have a, a way, uh, as I say, number three here, to pinpoint who is what they truly uh, their allegiances are, right? So those who oppose the official Bolshevik Church, they provided in this way authorities excuses for punitive measures, imprisonment, exile, and execution, and that was not at all uncommon with the renovationists, and it would continue, unfortunately, with the post. Uh, Sergius uh, declaration time period with the catacomb church, the same phenomenon. They were using these uh, tools, let's say, uh, the people had given themselves over to the to uh, obeying and uh, listening to the Soviet power. They were using those who opposed them, uh, uh, using them to find out who opposed them and therefore to say, well, these people are against also the <clears throat> Soviet power, which the renovationists have our blessing, so they're against us, and many people died uh, in that in that way. Um, it, so it was a a uh, a way for greater persecution, far from any kind of freedom for the church, which was quite delusional. Uh, so the general the general conceptual framework of the policy of the time encouraged the appearance within the church of reform movements of individuals whose motives had an admixture of what Levitin called poshlost or vulgarity. So the people that, so, so the, the Soviets, the, the uh, GPU and, the, and, and those who were charged with dividing the church, they, 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 it was in, of their interest to find out who are these people, what are they made up of, can we buy them out, can we pervert, uh, distort them? Are they are they going to be malleable? And so uh, the opportunism, the careerism, uh, and the desire to make a quick profit, all these things are characteristics shared by those involved right from the start in the renovationist movement. Very important. Uh, you can see that, again, it's not just what they're saying. It's not their agenda. It's not their ideas. It's also how they live uh, and who they are internally is going to make a big difference uh, in terms of uh, the whole spiritual battle, the whole spiritual warfare. It's not just the truth, but it's the way. It's always uh, important to look at both. And so you can see that those who have been given over to their passions, given over to ambition, are going to be manipulated by the enemy uh, for the enemy's uh, agenda. So now we're going to go into a look at the timeline because I think it's important. There's it's very easy to get, I got, doing research for this, it's easy to get lost, right? There's so much going on, and there's so much we could talk about. It's just, it, it, the 20s were just an amazing time for the Orthodox Church, amazing time of, dis, of disintegration and destruction for the most part uh, in many local churches, uh, but definitely in Russia, there was just 
uh, tremendous uh, warfare, uh, spiritual and, and literal going on. And, and so uh, I'm going to go through some big events in the timeline, and then we're going to revisit a few of these in more in depth. But I think it's important to be a little bit repetitive so that we all can stay, have, have that established in our mind, right? So we can, we can hang then uh, things on those and remember and put some, put some order to history and to these events. I think it's important that we do that. So we are in 1922. This is uh, April, May. A lot of events going on that we're going to talk about today are going to go on from April to August of 22, 1922. First of all, we have, we know now there was a secret meeting on the 20th uh, of, a, uh, of the GPU, and they passed this following resolution to subpoena Patriarch Tikhon and demand that he excommunicates the clergy that he had left, that had left Russia. That would have been the Russian church outside of Russia, the hierarchs like Metropolitan Anthony Kropovitsky, uh, and they were involved in pro-monarchist activities. Of course, they were uh, had left uh, Russia with the White Army and retreat, some of them, others beforehand, and so they were supporting, of course, the return of the Tsar. So they wanted Tikhon to excommunicate them as, I guess, uh, I don't know what, what they imagined the sin they were committing, but... Uh, um, that's they wanted that, that kind of statement to be sent, and if he refused to do so, he would be immediately arrested and charged with treason against the Soviet government, which means death. Uh, so this is going on in the background. This is their manipulation. Think about that, and then think about all. We have that in mind as you go through, and we talk about the renovationists and what's going on with Saint Tikhon. Um, so two days later. Under the strong pressure from the Soviet government, Patriarch Tikhon signed an edict to abolish the higher church administration abroad, which he had established and he had supported uh, initially. And he entrusted Metropolitan Evlogi the responsibility of organizing a new one. Now, I didn't, I didn't include this in this timeline, although if you go to the timelines that I, that I posted, and I suggest you be reading, it's in there. And there's a letter from Metropolitan of Logi to, uh, to uh, Metropolitan Anthony Kropovitsky saying that, I don't believe this. This is not from St. Tikhon. We're just going to ignore this. Uh, so nobody took this seriously outside of Russia. Well, anywhere. Uh, but they, they would go through the process of reestablishing uh, on one level for the sake of, uh, of keeping appearances. Uh, they would reestablish the uh, higher church administration abroad. And Borobesvitor Vasily Vinogradov, who at the time was head of Moscow Diocese and Council, a member of the high church council in Moscow, wrote in his memoirs about this. The abolishment of the higher church administration by Patriarch Tikhon was made exclusively under the categorical demand of the Soviet uh, government. The GPU put Patriarch Tikhon and all members of the Holy Synod under house arrest for three days until they gave their agreement to sign the document. At the same time, a court hearing of nine priests charged with agitation against the complication of church valuables was going on in Moscow. The GPU threatened Patriarch Tikhon that if he did not sign that edict, they would execute all of them. He signed it, and they still executed nine priests and three laymen on May 10th, a few days later. So that's what the Bolsheviks were like. They would blackmail you, and then they would do exactly with no sense whatsoever of regret or honor or anything. What, what kind of torture that would have been for the Patriarch Tika? Think about what he went through. Just that alone, just the psychological and spiritual warfare that he was under against these beasts. In 1922, in May, Patriarch Tika was arrested and was held under arrest for one year. So all throughout May, uh, from May of 22 to May of 23, with so much going on in the church, all over the place, uh, he is under house arrest 
without permission to see anyone. Before his arrest, Patriarch, Patriarch appointed Metropolitan to Kirill of Kazan as his first locum tenens, the substitute, the person who would take over if he couldn't. But at that time, Metropolitan Kirill was already in prison. And next on the list of substitutes was Metropolitan Agathang Agathangelo, Agathangelos of Yaroslav, who became the locum tenens of the patriarchal throne. Now, early June, about a month later, we have essentially the birth of the living church. Soviet government would not let locum tenens patriarchal of the patriarchal throne, Metropolitan Agathangel, to come to Moscow to take the reins of the government, the Russian church. We're going to talk about this a little bit further on. Uh, a group of renovations priests, well, that's, the, that's the main topic tonight, this event, uh, came uh, forward and tried to create a, and did create a new church government. They gained full support of the Soviet government, of course, and um, uh, they said such lies as the church had never been so free as it is now under communist rule. How could they say that with a straight face? On the 5th of June, the local tenant Metropolitan Agathangel writes an epistle from exile, and he says, despite my wish, I am deprived of the possibility to come to Moscow. Meanwhile, I received information from official sources that some people came to Moscow and took the reins of government in the Russian church. Who gave them that authority? I don't know. That's why I consider their power and acts unlawful. They declare about their intentions to re review dogmas, moral teachings of the Orthodox Church, holy canons of ecumenical councils, typicon given to us by the great Christian ascetics, and they create a new, as, a, as, a, as they called it, living church. So if he knew that, and he was essentially uh, deprived of communication and wasn't able to come to Moscow, don't you think all those bishops who ended up joining the living church knew the nefarious nature of this whole thing? This is what's rather mind-boggling, that somebody like Metropolitan Sergius could actually end up joining the living church. Uh, he called on all those bishops to live according to the decree issued by Patriarch Tikhon. You remember 362, very important for all the history of the Russian church in the 20th century, uh, and it was also by the Holy Synod in 1920. And that was that those who are unable to have contact with the Holy Synod and the Patriarch should become temporarily self-governing until full restoration of communication takes place. In other words, to gather around other local bishops and to work together. So that's what Agathangel says, and he's basically in charge of the church this time, says what, should, what, what, what they should do. Did they do that? Did anybody? Not, not much. I mean, the faithful, of course, did, but many ignored it. Uh, and of course, the, the living church leaders especially. Uh, the beginning of the trial of Metropolitan Benjamin. We're not going to talk much about that because we have a whole thing on that later on, but very important. Um, those who have, uh, well, you can see it on the screen. You can read it yourself and pause it if you're watching this on recording. I'm going to skip a few of these things because we're going to talk about it a little bit later. But I wanted, I wanted to give you that a date and time because and, and year because I think it's important for you to, to, to get a sense of the order of things. Now, just a few days later, Metropolitan Sergius of Nizhny Novgorod and his vicars, Archbishop Evdokim and Archbishop Serafim, joined the living church. So the trial is going on. These people of the living church are actually in the courtroom against Metropolitan Benjamin. We know they're working with the GPU. They have the support of the Soviets. We know that part of what, I mean, Peter Tikhan is in <clears throat> house arrest. I mean, all this, this we, we, they know this, and yet they go and join the living. It's just, it's just, it's just really is mind-boggling. In, in, in their declaration, they write the following. We completely share measures of the higher church administration. He's talking about the living church. We consider it the only canonical, legitimate, high church power and all orders and resolutions of it we consider obligatory and lawful. We call all true shepherds and faithful children of the church to follow our example. 
And unfortunately, because he was well known as wise surges, learned surges, many people did follow his example initially. Um, so that's that's one of the tragedies of our of our story tonight. One of the great tragedies, probably more tragic, I would say, than even the martyrdom of our saints, because of course that's the victory in the Christian life. The quintessential moment is the time of death. And those who give their life for Christ have the greatest victory in this life. So far worse in terms of spiritual life, of course, is this betrayal and support by Metropolitan Sergius of the Living Church. Uh, the youngest of Metropolitan Sergius Vicars, Bishop Barnabas, asked the Divievo Fool for Christ, Maria Dimitrieva, Dimitrievna, for advice. And she told him, stay put. Don't go anywhere. Stay in the old church. Reminds me of, uh, uh, of a movement in Greece called Neo-Orthodoxia, a new orthodoxy, right? Whenever you see this kind of thing, these kind of movements, just listen to what she's saying. Stay in the old church. Later, Metropolitan Sergius and Archbishop Seraphim repented publicly before Patriarch Deacon and were accepted back into the church. Archbishop of the Kim never repented and died in schism. What a tragedy. August now. They have their first council, the Living Church in Moscow. They've taken the reins of power. Patriarch Tikhon is in house arrest. Some of these bishops, like Sergius, have joined them, and now they're going to have their council. They're going to begin the process of changing the church and making all their innovations. And what are the innovations? Well, they have the new calendar, of course. That would have been a big deal. And that's interesting that renovationists across the board wanted so much to change the calendar. Uh, wanted to bring it to the Western calendar, change the Orthodox calendar. It's like a symbol of modernization. The abolition of the fast. Modernization of the services. By the way, one of the topics that ultimately did not get discussed in Crete, but was on the agenda for decades and had many, many, top, many, many papers and discussions about it was the same thing in Crete. That was abolition or change or, or, or twist or lightening of the fast. So if you look at what they're talking about in the renovationist movement in 1922, 23, what they want to see achieved, much of that is then transferred into the agenda for the Great and Holy Council, uh, the Aethic, what they called some of the very wrongly the Aethic Medical Council. It gets on the agenda and even is accomplished, unfortunately, in at least one local church. And it is a tragedy that there is a local church, the Patriarch of Constantinople, that is now allowed for and blessed one of the things that they were pushing for, and that is second marriage of the clergy. You see here, modernization of the services, second marriage of the clergy and marriage of bishops. That was what they were pushing for. But the Patriarch of Constantinople recently, apparently, has approved a second marriage for the clergy. In other words, when their wives die, they can go and get married again. That's never happened, uh, at least uh, since the canons and since the Holy Father's rule on this for more than a millennium. That has not been the life of the church, not been the teaching of the church. And so that is renovationism, right? That is the kind of spirit that we have that the canons are, you know, suggestions, <clears throat> essentially. We can ignore them. Uh, 1922, Soviet government is issuing uh, issued a decree recognizing the living church as the only legitimate Orthodox Church in Russia. The Orthodox Church becomes illegal. Patriarchate did not receive registration, became an outlawed religious organization, and after that, more arrest and more execution follows. At the end of 1922, the numbers that we have, which are very difficult to get, the accuracy is a bit questionable. We don't have all the numbers, but 2,691 priests 1,962 monks, 3,447 nuns were killed 
by the end of the year. Lord have mercy. About 25,000 faithful were executed during the confiscation of church valuables. That's over about a year, year and a half period. 25,000. 25,000. That's just mind boggling. What do we have that even approaches that in in in, in our uh, in our day? I mean, um, slaughtering twenty five thousand people in a year and a half, and, and and then there being people who join that and and get the blessing and say that uh, this is a good thing. We need to have a total innovation, a new renovationist church. Uh, it's going to achieve communist goals and all the rest. It's it's it's, it's rather. Unbelievable. So let's look a little bit now at the re renovationist coup, right? Did you guys see that? Renovationist coup. Uh, that is the uh, famous uh, uh, figurehead of the of the uh, of the living church, uh, Medensky. The beginnings of the Revolutionary Church is March to May of 1922. A little bit of repetition, but we're going to go back now and look at some of these aspects more in particular. In Petrograd in March, the renovationists, including Vilensky and Krasnitsky, published a letter attacking the church majority as counter-revolutionary and insisting on the immediate and total surrender of all church valuables. So Peter Artiga said, look, not everything. you got to keep... Uh, the things for the holy altar. We're not going to give those away. Those are not for sale. And here come the renovations to say, you're a counter-revolutionary. You're against the revolution. And you uh, are, are the problem. And we need to surrender all church valuables, which is rather mind-boggling. And how do they perform divine liturgy? Uh, I don't know. They must have obviously kept something back. But the things that were of the holy things were not to be given. Uh, out to the uh, dogs, and yet these folks had no problem whatsoever doing that. And this is the social gospel mentality, right? You know, it's all about this world, and then and and and, and uh, uh, they ignore the fact that you always have the poor with you. They go to the other extreme instead of loving your neighbor one by one, face to face. Now they become it's 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 a, it's, it's very much of the world and very much of the Lenin, uh, you know, the, the idea of Lenin, which is is we're gonna shape and form society in an impersonal way. We're gonna, we're gonna force people into a, a new way. It's gonna be entirely uh, impersonal and, uh, and, and, and without their freedom, we're just gonna shape them. This is somewhat similar, similar worldly approach about how things improve if they have even that, if they're sincere and they're trying to improve things they think they are, their whole methodology is worldly and ineffectual. Uh, Metropolitan Vinyamin in St. Petersburg come, came to an agreement with the authorities by which church valuables were subject to confiscation, confiscation, but the believers could make collections to offer money equal to the value of the sacramental objects. And so in this way, he was able to avoid what the renovations were calling for. And they weren't happy about that. You'll see what they did. Mm -hmm. In May, Tikhon was placed under house arrest. We talked about this already. And the three that we've talked about, Vidensky, Krasnitsky, and Antonin, take over the church. Uh, and they have their conference with a little bit of repetitive. Vinimin is in Petrograd. He refused to recognize this. He refused to recognize what they've done. And, of course, Vidensky was in his diocese. He takes action and excommunicates the frocks. Um, they go back to him in a few days. This is the kind of mentality these folks had. And they took the uh, secret police with them. And they say either you take back the excommunication or we'll put you on trial. For, for opposing the confiscation of church valuables, which could result in his death sentence. All right. So these are the these are the beginnings of this wonderful church movement for reform and renewal. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little about Metropolitan. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the meeting that, that's going to happen. It happened in uh, in Moscow. 
How did that come about and what, what was it all about? This is a meeting of the renovations with Patriarch Tikhon. On the 8th of May, so this is, be, this is a couple of weeks before the trial of Metropolitan Benjamin, 1922, three re renovationist priests, Videnski, Belkov, and Stadnik, arrived in Moscow from Petrograd to join Krasnitsky, who had arrived a few days earlier. Tukov arranged for the arrivals from Petrograd, together with the Muscovite Kalinovsky, to meet the imprisoned Patriarch Tikhon on 12th of May. Over the next few days, the coup was affected and announced in the second issue of the journal uh, of, their, of their, their journal there that they published for the Living Church, pointing out that under the leadership of Patriarch Tikhon, the church is experiencing total anarchy. This is what they said to him when they met with him. And that it has undermined his authority, its authority and influence over the masses as a result of its counter-revolutionary politics. Do you, do you, have you, uh, does it remind you of anything that, you know, don't get involved in politics, the church is involved in politics, people, people say that about people today. Uh, but politics is involved in the church, that's the thing people don't get. Politics has come into the life of the church and has taken up a war on things that the church holds dear, and that is the anthropology, the person of uh, the human person and everything that he is and what he's about. So it's impossible for the church to stand by. Even if you call it politics, it has to do with truth and faith uh, and salvation. Uh, so they accuse him of that, they accuse him of the politics, and in particular by its resistance, the church's resistance, the appropriation of church valuables. She's just giving it all away. They're saying the church, the group of clergy demand that the patriarch call without delay a council to organize the church and that he withdraw from church administration pending the council's decision. So there's, they have demands. Of course, the, military, the police there are there to make sure that the demands are met. And uh, Tikhan says, okay, I'll, I'll appoint my successor, Agathangel. Uh, he should arrive uh, until he arrives in Moscow. The renovationists would set up their... Uh, make a decision, take a decision. I don't think Tikhon agreed with this, obviously. Uh, but the renovations would set up a higher church administration, essentially take the place of the patriarch and the Holy Synod. Agathago was, in fact, prevented from reaching Moscow by the secret police themselves. They said he would come, or they, the patriarch Tikhon said I, he will come and take over things uh, since you want me to resign. But they didn't allow him to come. And so the, the renovationists just remained in power, basically. Shut down that bishop and remained in power, or uh, grabbed power. Uh, and they were now favored by the government, but even, unfortunately, by some Orthodox bishops. The renovated Orthodox Church evidently excited considerable interest and was initially successful in gaining the endorsement of leading clergy. That is one of the tragedies in the whole struggle. After Metropolitan Agathangelos was arrested and exiled to Siberia, not only did they not allow him to come, but they exiled him to Siberia. What do we have now? Evdokim, Antonin, and another bishop, Leonid, consecrate the proto priest Vedensky, Karnitsky, Stadik, and others to the episcopacy. So now they've decided that married men will become bishops. And they start to consecrate new bishops for the uh, renovationist church. Then they become the ecclesiastical rules throughout Russia. Essentially, they moved in, as you'll see, and took over buildings. And the the, uh, the state was was very supportive of their work to do that. So then this higher church administration began to demand that all should recognize them, while all those who did not recognize them were thrown into prison. You see how that works? Now you have to recognize the schismatic or you are an enemy of the state. That's something that looks eerily familiar to me in terms of what we might expect. And Father Daniel uh, Sosoyev pointed out that there come a day when they will call you an enemy of the state because of being faithful 
to the holy tradition and the teachings of the fathers. So this is what's happening here. They become enemies of the state. And they don't recognize the living church. Uh, Vedensky, Kranitsky, and Boryarsky went one evening to Metropolitan Benjamin and suggested that he also unite with them. And he says, this is a very interesting story now, four slides, we're going to go on with the story, so pay attention. He says, I was elected to the seat by the people, which last the people to assemble at the Alexander Nevsky Lavra, the big monastery. Then you explain to them what renovationism and the living church is. And so they agreed to this. That same evening, Metropolitan Benjamin phoned the deans of Leningrad, and changed the name, uh, that they should immediately announce in all the churches that some metropolitans had arrived from Moscow who had suggested that he accept renovationism. Tomorrow, May 18th, new style, as to serve in the Alexander Nevsky Lavra, the end of the liturgy, the representatives of the living church will explain what is renovationism and the living church, and I shall ask the whole people and all the believers who are interested in church matters to come at 10 o'clock to the Lavra. All right, so he's going to say, look, come and show us what you believe. Let's let's allow the people to judge. May 28th, the people began to come together for the whole of, from the whole of Leningrad. And in front of the entrance, they placed notebooks in which everyone's name could be recorded. From these notebooks, it is calculated 12,000 people attended as well as the clergy from every church. Three people, Archimandrite Makarios, Hiramak Seraphim, and Hierodeacon Herman, wrote down everything that happened and sent it to me in Odessa. This is the witness now who's telling us, he's giving us further insight into what happened in St. Petersburg in, in, uh, with, with Metropolitan Benjamin. How did he respond to the renovationists? What were the consequences? This is a, an uh, uh, insider's story, so to speak. At the end of the liturgy, Metropolitan Benjamin addressed the people, saying, There have arrived from Moscow representatives of the living church. They propose that we accept their teaching. I cannot do this without you, who elected me. So I have invited all of you who are interested in church affairs. Listen carefully. They will explain their program to you, and then I will express my own opinion. So then on the Ambon, Metropolitan Benjamin appointed eight members of the Presidia, which Paul himself, four clergy, and three laymen. Then he declared the session open. Videnski came out onto the ambon, and he began to explain to his, his program as follows. Brothers and sisters, up till now, he said, we have been subject to the czar and the metropolitans, but now we are free, and we ourselves must rule the people and the church. More than 1,900 years have already passed since it was written for us, the Lord Jesus Christ was born from the Virgin Mary and is the Son of God. But that is not true. We recognize the existence of God of Sabaoth, about whom our whole Bible and all the prophets have written. He's going back to his Judaism, apparently. Uh, and we recognize them. But Jesus Christ is not God, he says. He was simply a very clever man. And it is impossible to call Mary, who was born of a Jewish tribe and herself gave birth to Jesus, the mother of God and virgin. And so now we have all recognized the existence of God, that is, the God of Sabbath. And we must be united, both Jews and Catholics must be a living people's church. Well, that's strange. He was an Orthodox priest who became a metropolitan, and now he's teaching. Arianism and the unity of religions, very much in the spirit of Antichrist. When he had said this, the whole people cried out, We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God, and we recognize the Mother of God to be a virgin. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Yeah. Oh, no, that's right. Let's see. What are we at? We're at three now. Okay. All 
All right, so here we are. Sorry about that. Um, then Kranz, Kranznitsky came out and said, all right, so that was the first. Now we're coming to the second speaker. There's going to be a third as well. And he says, brothers and sisters, the baptism of small children has been accepted by us, but when the children is just born, he does not know or understand anything. Straight out of a Protestant handbook. They baptize him, put a little cross on him, and he grows up with the obligation of wearing this cross and not taking it off. But when he has grown up, he will learn and know everything. The cross will be quite unnecessary for him. So we do not recognize the baptism of young children. And when he comes of age, let him be baptized and wear a cross. In the same way, we do not recognize marriage. It is unnecessary and wrong. Why bind people? It should be like this. They should get together, register a civil marriage, and if one doesn't like the other, then let them go off in search of another and let him take another woman. We have freedom now. So we do not recognize any saints or relics, nor do we recognize monasticism. We don't need any monasticism. Before bishops had come, had to come from the monks. This is wrong, because a man cannot live without a woman, nor a woman without a man. Bishops must be married, and priests also. It, it, it used to be that if a priest's wife died, he had to remain a widower until his death. That is wrong, too. Now there's freedom. We can take a second and a third wife as priests, he means. And then Boyarsky came out. He said, although Zdensky said that Jesus Christ is not God, but a clever man, and the mother of God is not a virgin, I do not agree with this. I recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Mother of God a virgin. But baptism, marriage, holy relics, monasticism, I don't recognize these things. So this is the third and final speaker. And they totally lay out, this is an eyewitness account, totally lay out their entire program of heresy and delusion, dogmatic error, rejection of the holy tradition, holy fathers. And what do the people say? We do not need your explanations. We do not want your new living church. The beginnings of the renovations church now is taking, taking hold. And it is a clear and total disaster and departure from the Orthodox faith. Final, final slide here. Wrapping up, what happened with Metropolitan Benjamin before he went to trial? So there was a disturbance and a shouting among the people. Metropolitan Benjamin began to calm them down. When the people had settled, Metropolitan Benjamin said to them, this is thousands of people, right? You have all heard all the explanations of the representatives of the living church. Perhaps there is someone who will agree to join them? But I cannot. Because this is the same blasphemy which was previously preached by Arius and his followers. And so I, in accordance with the rules of the apostles and the ecumenical councils, am obliged to anathematize all the leaders of this living and new church and their followers. And then he immediately turned towards the royal doors and he said, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and of the all pure, immaculate, and virgin Mary, ever virgin his mother, the birth giver of God, I anathematize. And there and then the protodeacon pronounced anathema on all the teachers and followers of the living church. While they were chanting anathema, Vedensky fled out of the sanctuary through a side door into the courtyard of Alexander Nevsky Lavra and informed the GPU by telephone what had happened. But Metropolitan Benjamin began to preach and give further explanations to the people. While he was speaking, there appeared representatives of the Soviet authorities and arrested Metropolitan Benjamin and the four bishops and three laymen who had been appointed members of the Presidium. The Petrograd Cheka, the police, the secret police, and threatened, had threatened Vinyamin that if he did not revoke the excommunication, he would be put on trial for opposing the confiscation of church valuable, values. So he had excommunicated and anathematized. Uh, these innovators. And this trial could end up with a death sentence. Benjamin refused to give in to this pressure, was arrested, put on trial, and shot, together with three of his clergy. We'll talk about the great confessor and martyr. 
a little bit later, maybe next next time around. Very uh, very powerful witness to our our Lord. You see how he did not shrink before the the uh, trials or the risks, but he gave a witness to Christ at the end. Maybe we have his blessing. Finally, in this section. Uh, let's talk now about this renovationist Congress that's going to happen. That happened in August, right? So we're we're in late May for the trial of Benjamin. Now in August, the end of the summer, all these renovationists who now supposedly taken power, and all the people around them are, have to listen to them, and they're in charge of all these parishes and people, thousands, and tens of thousands of parishes. On the eve of this Congress that they had planned. The government required all non-commercial entities to obtain recognition from the state on pain of closure. So every church, the, 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 the national, uh, you know, patriarchy, local church, and every parish had to now get formal recognition and apply for all that from the Soviet state. In light of his development, in part, leading hierarchs came out in favor of the renovationists, including metropolitan surges. We said that earlier. Very tragic. Council was urged, among other things, to replace conservative church doctrine and uh, with a dynamic creativity and also to sanction the elevation of white clergy to, Epis uh, to Episcopal office. All right? So we know about that. The renovationists were all united in their opposition to capitalism as a great moral injustice and agreed that Christian love will not be reconciled with social economic inequality or the exploitation of man by man with the existence of capitalism in a Christian world. They therefore welcome Soviet power. We're so glad we have Soviet power, in this, which is striving to replace capitalism with communism. All right, so there you go. They are step-by-step step, tightening the noose on the church, opening themselves up entirely to this world and the horizontal and leaving the people of Russia search for the salvation of their soul in the, in the underground church, essentially. All right, so now we're in April 1923. This is, quote, Metropolitan, unquote, Peter Blinov. He was a married priest who joined uh, and was one of the leaders in the, in the new movement. In April of 1923 now, this is highlights. We're going to come back to some of this. this is, we're not going to be able to get to everything, as I said. Uh, April, May of 23, with the permission of the Soviet government, the Council of the Living Church took place in Moscow. This is a second council, I suppose. Yes, let me think. Uh, the, the elected president of the council was married metropolitan, quote-unquote, Peter Blinov. During the first year of his, of his existence, the Living Church accu accumulated many married bishops who participated in that council. Among some of the mo revolutions of this council were deposition of Patriarch Tikhon and even deprivation of his monastic habit. Adoption of the new Gregorian calendar, interesting, the calendar is always pushed as a part of the renovationist scheme. And the abolition of the prescription against marriage of bishops and second marriage for clergy. In his opening address, the Living Church Council, calling itself a second all Russian church council, went out of its way to praise the new higher organs of proletarian, pro, proletarian government and VI, uh, VI Lenin. All right. The Great October Revolution, they wrote, brings to life great values of equality and labor, which are found in Christian teachings. So this is a living church now. It's not a communist talking. <laughs> we must thank our government, which contrary to foreign standards, does not persecute the church. In Russia, everyone is free to proclaim their beliefs. The faithful should not see in the Soviet government the power of Antichrist. On the contrary, the Soviet government, by any means, by legal means, is the only one in the world to have about, excuse me, only one in the world to have brought about the ideals 
of the kingdom of God. Therefore, every believer must not only be an honest citizen, but also with the Soviet government, by all means, must struggle to implement the ideals of God's kingdom on earth. So here you have utopian, chiliasm, uh, you know, obviously incompatible with the Orthodox Christian vision of um, this world and the possibility for the kingdom of God to come into this world. All right. Let's keep going because there's still a lot of material. There's one, one could stop here and talk quite a bit, but uh, um, this is the character. This is this is what characterized, unfortunately, the uh, the living church, and it gets worse. So next time we'll get and we'll get get to cover some more material. Before we end this session, I want to talk about the role played in the legitimization of the so-called living church or renovationist church. Uh, I want to talk about the role played by the Patriarchate of Constantinople at the time, and particularly three patriarchs. And this is not at all irrelevant. It's very relevant because the renovationist movement was not just in Russia. In Russia, it was eventually overcome, and it's been discredited in the Patriarch of Constantinople. Unfortunately, it was never discredited, and the people who promoted it uh, are now seen by some as, um, as worthy of honor. First, we'll talk about Miletus IV at the Xaxis, and then we'll go to Gregory the Seventh, his successors, 1920-1923. So just two things of which he did many... Uh, things very active, uh, Meletius Metisagis, and he did many things that are very problematic as well. And uh, like the calendar change was essentially he was the initi initiate of that, although he didn't put it into effect. Uh, but Metisagis, um, not sure why he, he has a role here, but anyway, uh, why he would get involved in the Russian church. In August 1922, reports circulated worldwide that the Holy City of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, led by Patriarch Miletius, had declared Anglican holy orders to be valid. Now, this is a part and parcel of the renovationist mentality that was going on at the time, very much early ecumenism. Renovationists were early ecumenists. In February of 1923, Patriarch, Ecumenical Patriarch Miletius invited all of the Orthodox churches to a meeting in Constantinople, the so-called Pan-Orthodox Congress, mainly to consider revisions to the church calendar as well as remarriage of clergy. So again, the topics that the renovations are running with in Russia are, are the same, that at the very same time in Constantinople, they're running as well to try to implement. And they actually agreed at this Congress for some of these things to uh, take place that they ended up uh, putting into practice now uh, for, as we said, clergy who've lost their wives. This is when it begins uh, in earnest in Constantinople. So those are in August of 22 and February of 23. Now, if we go a little further on, we go to March of 24. Now, it's a little bit beyond our time frame in Russia, but it's it's very important. It's, it's actually a continuation of the same problem with the renovations. Patriarch Gregory the sixth, seventh of Constantinople sent a copy of the circular on the introduction of the new calendar. The same circular was sent to the name of Patriarch Tikhon, addressed to the head of the Renovationist Synod. So he's now sending encyclicals to the Renovationists. Of course, they're interpreting that as recognition. Uh, the Living Church perceived the circular as an act of recognition by the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Patriarch Gregory VII urged Patriarch Tikhon to abandon the Patriarchate. You can't make this up. He urged Patriarch Deacon to abandon the Patriarchate. Moreover, Patriarch Gregory said that he would take over at the initiation of church circles of the USSR. So he's going to go into the USSR and take over, apparently. The matter of pacifying the turmoil and disagreements that have recently occurred in the fraternal church, appointing a special patriarchal commission from the bishops for this. 
uh, probably a, uh, yeah, bridge too far for our friends in Constantinople. At the same time, Patriarch Gregory VII emphasized that in its activity, this commission should rely on church movement loyal to the government of the USSR. So he's totally identifying with the enemies of the church in Russia. What a, what a, uh, what a shame. In response, in a response letter to the name of Patriarch Gregory, the primate of the Russian church, St. Tikhon, wrote, We were embarrassed and surprised that the head of the Church of Constantinople, without any prior contact with us as the legal representative and head of the Russian Orthodox Church, interview, intervenes in the internal life and affairs of the autocephalous Russian Church. Sound familiar? <laughs> Anybody following church history for the last 10 years, five years? What do you think? Sound familiar? Interfering in the internal life of the autocephalous Orthodox Church of Russia. The Holy Council, see second and third rules of the Second Ecumenical Council, recognized only the primacy of honor for the Bishop of Constantinople, but did not recognize and do not recognize the primacy of authority for him. This is St. Tikhon writing. Pay attention. Therefore, any sending of any commission without the inter intercourse with me as the only legitimate Orthodox first hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church without my knowledge is unlawful, will not be accepted by the Russian Orthodox Church and the people, and will not bring peace, but even more turmoil and schism into the life of the, uh, that is already uh, suffering, uh, life of the already suffering Russian Orthodox Church. The people are not without, are not with schismatics, but with their legal and Orthodox patriarchy. So he, 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 he has to, write the Patriarch of Constantinople and say the ABCs of church life and of canon law. Obviously, they knew, but they chose not to ignore it. After this letter, Patriarch Gregory completely broke any communion with Patriarch Tikhon. Wow. And did everything to make the renovations recognized by other local Orthodox churches. Ultimately, of the four Eastern Patriarchs, only the Patriarch of, of Antioch, who was not in the orbit of the Fenar's influence, refused to side with the renovationists. Wow, it sounds really familiar. I think we've been here. We're being here again. Again, same story. Hmm. This is exactly what's happening. He's got Alexandria now supporting the schismatics in Ukraine, Church of Greece, at least the leadership, some of the leadership. So very interesting tactic. You have a church that's being brutally repressed, and you're siding with the oppressors, you're siding with the those who sold out the faith. That's 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 a recipe for disaster. Unfortunately, this is Gregory the seventh of Constantinople, God help him. All right, let's move on to the last. The last um, screen, and that is the third bishop of Constantinople, the one who will be the successor of Gregory VII, Patriarch Basil III of Constantinople. What's his stance? Perhaps it was just a fluke, one or two bishops? No, he continues it in some of the same ways. Let's see here. Patriarch Constantine, successor to Gregory III. I might, maybe I have that wrong then. It should be Gregory the. I've got the numbers wrong, I think. Uh, the other one should be the third. I don't know. Uh, stayed on the throne for only 43 days and was re repatriated by the Turkish government from the country and resigned by the, the Patriarchate a few months later. In his place, much brother Basil of Ni Nicaea, who continued the line of approachment with the renovations, was elected. Synod of the Living Church responded to this election with a message. This is going on again now. The next Patriarch is getting a letter from the Living Church. When it asked the new patriarch to paternally take care of our church sorrow and move to save the ailing daughter of the Russian church. Uh, and also invited him to take part in the renovationist local council. Patriarch Basil replied, we are present in abstention with you and as far as possible will contribute to the speedy and complete elimination of the sad division, which being harmful to our Orthodox Church also fills the great mother church with the deepest sorrow. So apparently recognizing the legitimacy of this as leaders in the church is no rebuttal that they need to repent or anything like that. Uh, 
it seems seems like it's giving the thumb of approval here. This letter, as well as some other documents, allowed the schismatic renovations to claim that they were in communion with the original center of Orthodox Christianity of Orthodox Church and reject all canonical body, bodies uh, of church authority. Schismatists constantly emphasized that they were recognized by the Eastern Patriarchs, which meant that there could be no doubt about their legitimacy. So they played a tremendously destructive role in this history uh, of the Russian people, the Russian church. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, uh, know-it-alls from Washington, D.C. Um, and Constantinople, I should say. <laughs> but through their influences in the West. All right, so last two slides. The living church experience. So Levitim gives us again some insights into the experience of the living church in their parishes. Let's 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 see what, what what's going on in their parish level. Is, is this is this a vibrant church, a living church? What's it like? And he is someone who lived it. So this is a personal memoir, and he's positive and he's talking about his experience in the churches. And he says, if he were asked what was his version of an ideal church community. He said, I would always recall Petrograd in the 1920s, all right? So this is 1920s, 23, 24, 25, uh, in St. Petersburg. And he describes it. Sermons were delivered not only on Sundays, as before the revolution, but on weekdays as well, number one. In many churches, one or two days a week would be set aside for serious theological lectures, discussions and debates, between the clerics and the lady after brief services. Number two, um, there would be benches and chairs set up for this in the churches. Hmm. In, in Russia, we know that there's not really benches and chairs in the churches. Uh, practically every church that had at least one such popular priest, preacher, preached teacher around whom believers flocked until these priests disappeared in the prisons by the late 1920s or early 1930s. All right. So that. That's his experience of the church. It's really focused on what? Intellectualism, intellectual life, theological discussion, uh, outside of the divine services. Let's see now. We're going to contrast that with another witness at the time. Uh, because it, the, the note here, the footnote is that because uh, they're talking about benches and chairs, it would suggest a renovationist rather than a mainstream Orthodox practice, okay? They consider that in Russia at the time to be an innovation and not something uh, that is done uh, in the churches, bringing those in. A nostalgic account of an Orthodox practice now, under persecution, same time period, serves to, uh, services conducted by Archpriest Sergius Goloshapov, I don't know if I'm saying that right, when together with many others, he was shot in the Butovo firing range, in the Holy Trinity Church in Nikit. So this is a new martyr, okay? But he's talking about his time in the parish under persecution. What was it like? Same time period as this other witness who uh, we just read, right? So he says the following about the Orthodox, not the renovations, but the Orthodox Church, the parish. The electric light did not strike your eyes as the temple was lit only by candles. Sorry, I need to go on. There you go. There it is. Uh, only by candles and icon lamps, which were put out to a certain amount of the service, at a certain amount of the service, and then lit again in accordance with the church rule. On major feasts, we celebrated all night vigils. This meant that we began our worship at 10 in the evening and finished at 5 or 6 in the morning. That's the all night vigil. That's a true all night vigil. 10 in the evening at 6 in the morning. Although the mediocrity of our external worship on great festivals was absolutely everything, uh, evident, we did not see it. All right? The warmth of joint prayer transformed everything. Our poverty manifested itself in the form of wealth, and our souls were filled with radiant joy. So there are two experiences of churches, one Orthodox, one Renovationist. One is almost not at all in the church at all for divine services. Here, this is someone who's expressing the great prayer, uh, the uh, 
grace of prayer that she feels and experiences the warmth of joint prayer and all the rest, right? So I think that gives you some insights into what we're dealing with in terms of uh, the uh, on the ground, not just in words. All right, so hopefully that first part, we're going to go probably another half an hour on the Orthodox response and what happened. How did it end? What? How did it come to an end and what it means for today? Um, I want to recommend before I forget, anybody who's interested in a little application, because that's my goal here is to apply all this we're learning to our contemporary situation, is to go to Father John Whiteford. He has an article. You can search for it, Renovationism 2.0. Renovationism 2.0, if you have not read it, it's, it's a good thing to read. Uh, points out the current dangers of renovation in the Orthodox Church and, and begins by discussing the renovationists. So now that you've heard this, you've seen the history, you've got the timeline, when you go to Father John's article, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with this. And now you're going to have a better understanding of renovationism and neo-renovationism, which is in the church today, which would include all kinds of innovations in, in, in not only worship, but in, mainly in dogma and ethos, right? Uh, that's where uh, the innovations um, are coming. So let's take some questions. We have questions. Uh, and let's get the first one here. A little bit of water, and then we're right with you. Okay. What was Kranzinitsky's official position in the church? Well, he was a priest. A married priest. Uh, being a careerist and demolishing the office of the bishopcy and wanting clergy to be loyal to him, did he push for this as a bishop himself? So what happened was they took over, as you saw. They came down and took over. They got the blessing of the Soviets, basically. And then they had, we didn't get there tonight. We'll get there next week. They had uh, more details about it. They had three bishops, Antonin uh, I think it was Leonid and another, I can't remember the name, uh, consecrate these married priests as bishops. I think we mentioned that actually, yeah. And so now they are a part of the ruling uh, class uh, married bishops uh, in, the, uh, in the church. And they're, they have, uh, um, you know, not only political, but now they have uh, sarsodactyl, uh, episcopal power in the church. And he was uh, uh, being a secure demolished in the office. Did he push this as a bishop himself? Yes, he did. He became a bishop, and he pushed for that as a bishop. So um, why do some churches have Soviet images? I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I can only imagine that. Some of the new churches that were built in Russia, maybe, and the one that I heard about, the only one really that I heard about is the one in the military, the military um, cathedral there for the for the military. And I suppose what they're trying to do there is to commemorate the past, uh, you know, national uh, events and war and defending the country and all the rest. Uh, I don't think it's wise or really blessed. So it is. I think it's problematic. I don't think we can do that. We can't just act like nothing happened. Nothing happened. The government did not uh, was not atheist. So it's a little. It's a. It's a little problematic, to say the least, to put those kind of images in there. And I, I think it's associated with mural, murals or paintings that are describing uh, the history of uh, uh, of the last hundred years. So I don't know. That's problematic. Why do some churches have Soviet images? We say that. Why do you, uh, would you equate modernism today in the church to renovationism? Well, I think they're similar. Yes, they're isms and they're, they're, they're like cousins um, and they're very similar. So modernism usually is this idea that we've got to update, we've got to journamento, right? We've got to bring it up to date. We're out of, we're out of date. We're out of, uh, we're old fashioned and we're not able to communicate to the world. We've got to change our ways, we've changed our appearances, we've got to make things more uh, akin to modernity, the way we build our churches, the way we build uh, paint our icons, all these things need to change so they fit into the modern man, right? That's kind of modernism. Uh, and renovationism is similar 
Um, maybe the reasoning is not the same, but the outcome is the same, and that is that you have all kinds of innovations in worship and morals and even dogma um, and uh, total disconnect with the need for continuity in those in those innovations. Um, so, I mean, would I would I equate it? Not not entirely, but closely. It's pretty close. What happened to Lay, who did not accept the Renovations Church? What happened to Layman? Is that is that what that means? What happened to Layman, who did not accept the Renovations Church? Um, well, we had the numbers I quoted there. We had uh, twenty five thousand uh, slaughtered, uh, and I think in that. Other numbers. There was some other numbers that I, I uh, that I quoted. In any case, a lot of people died if they weren't accepting the the renovationists' uh, rule over a parish. They would fight over it, and then the it would be an opportunity for the uh, Communist Party to come in and do away with those who opposed them uh, through the uh, resistance against the you know, renovationists. I mean, that it didn't always happen. It depended on the on the local makeup of things, but. Uh, they were martyrs from the resistance to the uh, renovationists, for sure. Many. All right, is that the is that is that the sum of the questions coming from YouTube tonight? If uh, if you have anybody has any other questions from YouTube, you can ask them. I'll come back in a mi minute. Uh, we're going to go to Crowdcast and see what questions we can answer here. Uh, but if you are on YouTube or Facebook and you want to ask a question, here's your opportunity. Write it there for John, and he'll pass it on to me. Um, maybe you have <clears throat> just whatever, whatever it might be. Father Bless, nowadays it seems very challenging. Before we get into that question, let's see if there's any questions on topic, all right? Uh, one second. It's in Carthage. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little uh, tired today, Kevin. Kevin picked that up. Yeah. Uh, so one question here. I, mean, I didn't sleep much at all. Is this surviving Russian church still tainted with by communists and reformers? That's a good question. Um, there's no doubt about. If you want to talk about. You know, communist, politically communist, I don't have a lot of personal knowledge and information about what's going on in Russia today, so I'm not really in a position to answer. Uh, but as far as reformers go, as far as renovationists go, I think that, as I said, the renovationist spirit is alive and well. And I recommended that article by Father John Whiteford. He mentions a number of sources here in the United States uh, that are perfectly in sync with some of the ideas and and outlooks of uh, the outlook of those renovations back in the 20s so 100 years ago similar issues still dealing with the, uh, the same mentality so renovationism is a rationalism and a uh, uh, arrogance uh, disconnect from the living tradition uh, a, a a focus on things that are uh, uh, are external and worldly, not on the, on the inner man. You see that in you know, this whole discussion, the church is seen in on the political and social sphere. The inner life of man is not even breached. Uh, it's total. It's a total distortion of the of the role of the church in the world, and it's very very much alive today that, that the world wants to make the church to serve those goals, and that of course is the spirit of Antichrist, right? When, when, when the church becomes the world, when the church serves the world, works for the world, it, 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 is, it is at the service of building a utopia, which is exactly what was going on in, in the 20s and now is again, uh, or never really left, but is, is, is coming back uh, strong today, uh, that uh, uh, whether it be transhumanism or uh, globalism or all the various isms that are meant to perfect life and make, uh, bring peace and security throughout the world, all of these, uh, all these movements, uh, when they're totally detached from Christ and the eternal life, uh, become ends in themselves, and they they will be put to the service of the Antichrist. So that spirit 
Uh, we often talk about ecumenism. We often talk about, uh, you know, the various other isms in the church. Secularism, of course, is the catch-all phrase. It's the base for all these uh, these these lesser movements. Uh, it, and it is it is uh, at the heart of uh, uh, the base of renovationism. Uh, but um, this spirit of uh, of putting lowering things at the level of the social the communal, and putting the church at the service of the world uh, is definitely a preparation for and is already a part of the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, so it is extremely important uh, that when we when we talk about where is this all headed? What's the point? What, what are all the innovations leading to? They're not uh, just leading to distortions and innovations for their the sake of the sources and innovations, but they're leading to a um, uh, uh, an end, which is the ascent of Antichrist. That's where things are meant to go. Uh, so the, the, the spirit of renovation, uh, which is not about following the Holy Fathers, which is the cornerstone of our life in Christ, it's following the Ho Holy Fathers. That's the rudder, right? That's what keeps us on the straight and narrow. That's what makes all of these external things uh, not antagonistic toward the inner life, but supportive. Like they, they, there's a symphony, there's a harmony. Uh, when we follow the Holy Fathers, we have the right hierarchy of things. We, get, we order things properly uh, and we don't, we don't go off in, in pursuits of, uh, of windmills and, and, and utopias. Uh, so I think there is definitely surviving, not in the Russian church alone, but in all the local churches and in, in, in the Patriarch of Constantinople, there is definitely a major spirit of renovationism. Because remember now, Metaxakis, Metaxakis who <clears throat> introduced those innovations and uh, was, was at one with the spirit of the renovationists in Russia with uh, changing uh, the, the uh, calendar, uh, uh, updating and modernizing the churches in various ways, uh, allowing for priests to be married after they're widowed, all these things that were consistent with the renovations in Russia. <clears throat> he, um, he's, he's celebrated today. They're not looking back and saying, what a terrible time of innovation and renovationism that happened in the 1920s in the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Uh, in fact, today I read uh, the the biography that's offered online by official sources of Metasakis, and there's an apology for him in there because they know that he's attacked for his uh, uh, for his uh, obvious masonry involved as a mason that's re referenced in numerous places uh, by Anglicans that he was connected with in, in, in London. They come out and say very bl bluntly. Uh, my fellow brother in the in the in the order of the Masons. That's what that's what he says when he congratulates him on becoming the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Uh, so there's the, during his life he was celebrated as a Mason, and of course after he died. So you have people like that who led the church, and there's no sense of this person needing to be uh, rejected and his views rejected. Uh, so renovationism did not die. In, uh, in Russia in the 30s or early 40s. Renovation continues, the spirit of renovation continues. And you'll see that there'll be many people who will say that what happens with Patriarch Sergius, we're gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit, but what happens with Patriarch Sergius in, um, in 27 and afterwards is really a continuation of the stance of the renovationists, unfortunately. Uh, on one level, he's fighting them, and then he ends up succumbing to the same stance that they took with regard to the Soviet power. And so maybe he doesn't have the, the same penchant for innovation, uh, but the stance is very similar, and that is subjection to uh, the powers of the world. All right, so I think that's answering your question, uh, Desia. Uh, let's go back to our uh, YouTube. Maybe we got some more questions. Uh, what is the best defense against renovationists? If you are new to orthodoxy, people tell you to be humble. Well, that's a good thing. We need to be humble. What is hum humility all about? The humility is being in the truth. Humility is not plain humble. Oh, I'm humble. I don't know anything. I'm stupid. I, I don't. I'm not any good at anything. Right? That's not humble. That's it. That's 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 plain humble. 
that's that's worse <laughs> than 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 uh, uh, it's, it's, it's total distortion of humility. Humility is being in the truth, right? So f so the cornerstone and the foundation of humility is going to be imitating and following the saints and uh, and loving the truth. You can't talk about assimilating and acquiring humility without loving the truth and loving the person who is truth, who is Christ. Uh, so when these uh, issues of faith and, and ethos and dogma come up and you are confronted with them and you say, well, um, certainly you can say, you know, I don't know, but uh, I want to know, I want to learn, I want to understand, and here's what so and here's what Saint So and So says, and here's what Saint So and So says, and what does this mean? And you can ask questions. You can always ask questions, and questions are oftentimes the best things you can ask, ask when you're talking to people who are uh, in a hierarchy, uh, because well, they don't often have ears to hear if you don't ask questions. Uh, but questions can often be very, very uh, beneficial to getting to the truth of things. So I think um, humility means we understand where we are, who we are. We have self-knowledge. Uh, and part of being in the church is being co-responsible for the church. That's part of being a humble member of the church. Uh, another thing is that um, we see these things as not something that uh, we have authority or something, but we have, we have uh, to have to approach these issues uh, of renovationism and innovation and modernism uh, as uh, uh, with pain of heart and as one who is seeking for the truth to be heard and understood for the salvation of himself and, and, and his brothers and sisters. So out of love, we're going to struggle to understand these things so that we can help others and, and ourselves avoid the pitfalls. Um, all of that, of course, is a humble stance. Uh, uh, humility doesn't mean checking out. Humility, mean, humility doesn't mean indifference. Humility doesn't mean I don't care if the priest is right or wrong. It's his problem. Uh, they'll deal with it. That's not humility. That's not because humility and love go to, go hand in hand. That's not love. All right. So uh, remember, humility is being in the truth. It's being it's living in the truth about yourself, about the world, and about Christ. As first and foremost, you cannot be humble if you're not uh, a lover of the truth and in the truth and have self-knowledge and, and, and knowledge of God. Those are all connected. All right, how can we re reconcile the glorification of St. Luke of Crimea considering that he was part of the synod that elected Metropolitan Sergius as patriarch? Well, that's a good question, and I will deal with that question when we get a little bit further on when we talk about Sergius. Uh, and it's a difficult question to answer. Um, but there are there is an answer to that, but I'm not going to answer it tonight because we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, stick with me. Come back when we talk about surgeonism and the next uh, set. Uh, let's see, that's I think lesson seven, eight, six, seven, eight. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, how is the re renovationist move to have an altar placed in the center of the church a bad thing? Uh, well, because we haven't done that, and we haven't done that ever. Uh, altar in the middle of the church. Now we have a liturgy of St. John, St. Yaakovos, which has it not quite in the middle, but a little bit to the front. Uh, but that liturgy is only served, what, once or twice a year. So the tradition of the church, the practice of the church is what you see and has been for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, when we tweak with and overturn that tradition, which has produced saints, on what basis do we do that? If, if we have saints again and again being produced, and that's the tradition, and that's what's come down to us, why do we need to change? What is it that's going to change, that needs to be changed? Um, and who are we to go and start changing things? That's just not the stance that a follower of the Holy Fathers has. He doesn't approach things like that. Um, so I think uh, renovationism is... Uh, it's pretty obvious that these were men of ambition, men of, uh, uh, of a more uh, individualistic Protestant uh, ethos. They wanted to uh, change the church, not be changed by it. 
Uh, so I think that's the problem: is that when when you say we're gonna we're gonna disregard one of the one of the ideas, it's very it's very much akin to the Protestant ideas. You go back, you jump over history, and you go back and you find something that was done in the 15th or 13th or 10th or 9th century, and you say, well, why can't we do that? And then you doubt the, 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 the history of the church. You doubt the, the process by which we arrived. And, and you say, well, we, we're going to lower all these iconostats. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take the liturgy outside of the, of the iconostats and, and, and the altar. We're going to make it uh, available to the people. All of that, all of that uh, stance and that move is not what you see in the lives of the saints. Tell me one saint in the last 200 years who was an innovator and in a, in a, in a renovationist who had that stance, who said that, that my job here is to get back to the 7th century, the 10th century, 12th century, recover what we've lost, supposedly. That whole spirit and stance is not really consistent with our saints. Another question. Please expand. On the similarities between the Living Church of the Soviet Union and the Renovationist Church of the Masonic Patriarchs of Greece and Constantinople. Well, I think we've named some of the similarities right off the bat. It's the whole stance, the whole approach, right? It's the idea that that we're, we're, we've been we've been given by God the job to change and 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 and, and not just. Not just refocus everyone to the spiritual life, not bring them back to the traditions of text. We have the Kolivadis fathers, we have the Philokalia. What do they do? What did St. Nicodemus do? What did St. Paisius do? Did they innovate? Did they, were they concerned about the forms and changing the liturgical life? Uh, what was their whole life about? It was about getting the sources of the spiritual life and the, the depths of the spiritual life, the prayer, the hesychastic life getting back to that and, and refocusing on that, which never was never lost, but it was, it was less accessible to, to the math, to the mass of the, of the people of the church and bringing that to them so they can enter into the kingdom of God. They weren't focusing on externals and, and on the social communal level of the church. Uh, and so there wasn't a innovation or renovationism going on in the life, in the lives of those saints. I'll just give you one example. So the stance today is uh, one, well, one of the motivations that were very clear in the Pan-Orthodox Congress was that we're going to change things in order to bring ourselves closer to the West. It was, very, it was, it was said very clearly. We want to increase unity with the heterodox, so we're going to change things. We're going to send our students to their theological schools. That was one of the decisions made in the Pan-Orthodox Congress. Uh, of course, they considered the heterodox churches as churches, that's an heretical ecclesiology. Um, the the, the uh, uh, renovationists in Russia had the same kind of ecumenistic outlook, uh, very blatantly say, look, we've got to unite ourselves with the, with the uh, Latins and with even with the Jews. There was the, uh, that idea as well, uh, pan pan religious uh, unity. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of a lot of those same things going on in both uh, renovationist movements, and it's not surprising. It, there there weren't they weren't two different islands here. They were they were the the, the prehistory of both of them going back into the 1800s. That was going on for decades. That whole movement, and it's clearly from heterodox Western sources. A lot of this is coming, so they have that in common. Uh, and it is, and I love the answer of Saint Hilarion Trotsky uh, in his uh, reply to, to the, I think it's um, Gardner. Uh, it's on the Unity of the Church, basically. You can find that online. It's a PDF. And 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 they're coming with these student movements, and they're coming with these all this external activity and and worldliness, and and that's where that's what's going to is really necessary for the church. We need to go out. We need to be active, right? Which is which is fine, but that's not that's not the bread and butter. That's not the heart of the church. That's not that's not what gets us closer to God, right? Those things are fruits, perhaps, but they became the focus. And he says, put all those away and just enter into the church. It's all there. You don't need to innovate. You don't need to improve on. You don't need to tweak to make it acceptable to make it. Uh, amiable to heterodox and all the rest. This is the kind of spirit that we saw in both uh, of these uh, uh, 
renovationists, right? Uh, so why was the catacomb Church of Russia legitimate, but the true of, of Greece proud, deluded, and schismatic? Well, that's a question for, for a, another session. It's a very long uh, and involved question. First of all, they're not the same thing. They're not at all historically the same thing. Uh, so the context is different. Um, and the Catacomb Church of Russia, depending on which saint we're talking about, because there was not a unified, I mean, in Greece, you had more or less a unified movement, at least for the first few decades. And there was an attempt, well, not, you, there, was a, there was schisms early as well with Matthew Weitz, but for the most part, the voice was unified. In Russia, because of the circumstances, you had uh, a, a general reaction which was unified, but you had a lot of different levels of, of, of understanding. Like one would cease commemoration, another would cease communion with Sergius. I'm getting, we're getting ahead of ourselves as well. I don't like answering things piecemeal, but trying to give you some material to work on. Um, so one of the keys is in the, is the question of methodology. Why is a reaction to innovation blessed or not blessed? It's going to be based on the patristic methodology. That's what's at stake. And so when we're going to assess what they did in Russia and what they did in Greece in response to renovationism and ecumenism, it's going to depend on the patristic methodology and the, the ecclesiology that comes out of that of that uh, struggle against heresy, right? That's what that's what's going to be missing uh, in 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 certain places in both Russia and in in Greece. Uh, I don't think I don't I wouldn't characterize it like you did. I wouldn't say one is legitimate and one is diluted and schismatic. Uh, I would say that there's it's much more nuanced in both cases, and that there are in in Church of Russia there are problems. Uh, in, with some, and then in the same with Greece. Uh, so, uh, but that's a whole that's a whole long discussion about ecclesiology and patristic methodology in response to heresy. Um, and that's really, I think, beyond the scope of this. We're going to get into that when we get into Sergianism and the response of the Holy Fathers in Russia to Sergianism. We're going to deal with some of that, and then I think you'll have your your answer will come. Of itself, when we're talking about <clears throat> the uh, response to surgeon, which is not too far from that. Uh, all right, let's see if we have any other questions before we head off. In the spirit of Reformation modernization, is the spirit of Reformation modernization um, and liturgical revival, revival? which fathers Alexander Schmemann and John Meindorf championed akin to the renovationist spirit we're talking about here. I'm not thinking of their motivations, which I have no doubt were, weren't malicious as those of the renovations were, but only of the spirit which drove them. So the question is, is the Reformation modernization liturgical revival that is associated with Father Alexander Schmemann, mostly, uh, and championed akin to the Reformation, re renovationist spirit we're talking about. Well, that is, uh, that is, in some ways, I think Father Seraphim Rose answered this question, and he did see aspects of the uh, liturgical, liturgical revival, so to speak, um, that Father Alexander Spurman was was attempting to be akin to some of the um, to be a kind of neo renovationism, fathers, 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 Seraphim Rose does write about this. I would say I'll give you one story that I heard that I think is epitomizes the problem with the approach that is said to have been taken and, and seems to be have taken by Father Alexander Schmemann. There was a there was a meeting I think in the, like it would have been in the seventies and the and it was in Boston or in New York. I remember, but it, the um, Disciple of Saint Eustin Popovich, Bishop Athanasius Yevtich. I think he was, he was just a, um, he was just a archimandrite or a hieromonk at the time. I don't think he was a bishop. He was at this conference. Father Alexander Schmemann was saying, "Look, we've got to get rid of all these these layers of liturgical additions that have gone on throughout history, and we have so many saints that we celebrate, and 
And when you get back to the to the core of the liturgical tradition, which is not the lives of the saints and this and the, uh, the 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 celebration of the saints, but it's the it's the you know the the twelve feasts and it's, it's the daily you know the daily uh, commemorations, the weekly commemorations, or whatever. I don't I don't know I don't remember all the details, but they were just told to me fairly uh, simply. And um, and you know, Bishop uh, Father Athanasius at the time rejected. Out of hand and 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 forcefully, this idea, precisely because at the base of this approach is a disregard for the for the God given and inspired guidance of the Holy Spirit of the Church throughout all the ages and of the Holy Tradition, and it, it's it's there seems to be a doubting of these things given being given precisely by God. So there's a stance which says I'm gonna, I'm gonna undo this. I'm gonna ignore this because I consider it a bad development. But I mean, it's if that's our stance and we're gonna go rewrite things and go back, that's really a I think a kind of a Protestant stance. I don't think it's an Orthodox stance. It's not how we look at the Holy Tradition. Not how we look at things, and we don't doubt that. And Father Seraphim Rose stresses this. And I think it's very important. I think it's stressed. By all the saints, but I mean, Father Zaire from actually writes this in a very convincing way, and he says that if you're not following the saints before you, immediately before you, you cannot follow the saints before them and the ancient saints and all the rest. That's how we have received orthodoxy from our fathers of this day and age. And if you don't receive orthodoxy like that, if there's been an innovation and a distortion and a renovation. That's a huge problem. That's a massive problem. That's not how it, I mean, that that's a that's a undoing of holy tradition and and an overturning that will have very bad and grave consequences. And I think we're seeing some of those consequences in our day and age. Those uh, who live next to the saints and live under them as their disciples, uh, guide they have them as their guides. Those are the ones who are initiated into the living tradition, and so that's at the, at the heart of the church. That's what that's what from generation to generation continues the apostolic succession, the real spiritually as was the spiritual apostolic succession, let's say, uh, and and that's the heart of orthodoxy. So uh, the idea that I mean, I, you don't see the lives of the saints that stands. So I think that's the problem. That's one aspect of the problematic stance. That you see in some of these reform, revival, uh, you know, liturgical renewal, whatever you want to call it, movements. It's fundamentally the problem with the whole stance, I think, and it's not it's not something that resonates with uh, an or, the orthodox, and and you don't see it in, in in the saints. The saints don't do that. They're not concerned near nearly as much as some of these academics with the form. Uh, and the need to reform the form because they're interested in entering into the essence, and it's and it's and and it's preserved. The life is preserved, and that's what's that's why these things exist to get us to the life. Uh, so I think that's it's it, that's in, in in two words. I think that's the big problem. It's, it, I, you can get into all kinds of details and say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but um, in, at the end of the day, it's a it's a problem with the whole overall stance that we have. And how we're receiving the holy tradition, how we're standing before the saints of our day, how we're being grafted onto the to the to the, uh, the tree uh, of holy tradition. That's that's the problem. Uh, and so we stand inevitably when we stand as one who's going to reform. We stand with pride. We stand with uh, a critical spirit. We stand. We don't stand with a, with a spirit of of obedience and of uh, a discipleship. All right, I think that's going to call it. We're going to call it for tonight. Um, I want to apologize for some of my uh, laps tonight. Uh, we're working all night to get this for you and did not sleep a wink. So that's probably why I've been had a little, a couple times I had a little blank, uh, blank spots. Uh, that hopefully will not happen again. Forgive me for that. Hopefully the text uh, it had made up for some of my lacking tonight. My critical uh, analysis and, and uh, application. Uh, but we're going to continue that next week. Hopefully that will be even more so, so we can apply this uh, to our own day 
Um, but if you go and just go and search that little article out by Father, Father John um, Whiteford, it's called Renovationism 2.0. And I think it's a great application in our day and age to some of the things that the church is facing with uh, innovation in terms of ethos and morality and uh, homosexual uh, homosexuality and the boundaries that have always been laid down by the church. Uh, that 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 spirit of innovation and renovation is very much alive today, and the renovationists um, need to be spotted. They need to be avoided, and they need to be countered by the saints and by the church. And all of you who are newly illumined, coming to the church, looking for the uh, narrow path, uh, make sure you do not get sucked into that. It's a waste of your time, but it's also very dangerous spiritually. None of that is going to be uh, make you holy. Spending hours and hours going through these uh, academic uh, um, papers, some of them are worthwhile, most of them aren't. They're not going to bring you closer to uh, the heart of the tradition, which is uh, where we are sanctified, right? The life of uh, the church, the deep life of prayer and hesychasm and asceticism and all that. This is what's missing uh, for most of us. Uh, we feel uh, we see it, we want it, but we seem, it seems to be far off from us because perhaps we don't have a spiritual guide. We don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of contact with the living tradition, uh, especially in the diaspora around the world where there's not a lot of monasteries and all the rest. But that's, the, that's what needs, that's where the church is going to grow. That's where the people's lives are changed. That's where the transformation happens. That's where the mission work happens. Uh, it is a grave error if we follow the mentality and the example of the West. Remember what he said, the uh, historian of the renovations. He said, oh, uh, Antonin, his work uh, seems to be fulfilled in Vatican II. And now we have a lot of these academics, these renovationists in our days, essentially uh, <clears throat> jealous that we don't have our own Vatican II. What they did in the Vatican II was go to the academics, go to the renovationists, go to the ones who were searching for renewal and going back because they lost it. Go to them and figure out what the church is. If that's not a sign that you're not the church and you've lost it, I don't know what it is. They admit by their whole process, and their whole approach in Vatican II that they don't have the holy tradition. And then people imitate them the renovationists in the Orthodox Church, in people, in the people who, who, for the most part, for the for the most part, some of the people who are very instrumental in shaping and taking uh, uh, and producing uh, Crete, uh, are very much in that same vein. In fact, they even called upon Vatican II as a witness what they wanted to accomplish, uh, and so that's. That kind of uh, renovation innovation is so far from the Holy Tradition and the Holy Fathers. Let it be far from us, far from us. Get it far away from us. We don't want anything to do with it. We want to be disciples of the saints. And, of course, that means, again, disciples of the saints in this day and age, uh, following them, uh, the new martyrs, uh, the ascetics on Athos, uh, the great missionaries of the 20th century like Papa Cosmas, uh, and St. Nicholas of Japan, and all these great saints that we have so much, uh, thank God, in English now. These are these are our, our, our daily bread, along with the Holy Scriptures and the liturgical life of the Church. Let all of that renovation and innovation be far, far from us, and God help those who have been entangled in it and think this is, the, this is their calling, they're going to become holy because they're going to produce um, the, 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 the newest and latest word on this aspect of what we've gotten wrong in holy tradition for the last two two thousand years, God help them. All right, this that that ends it tonight, and uh, God bless you. And we'll see you in one week uh, for a continuation of renovations, and we'll look at the Bolshevik and their methodology as well. God bless. We'll chant to the Holy Cross. <laughs> So son kiri eton la onsu, kev lo yi son, ting clerono mi ansu, ni kastis basi nem si kanta barbaro,
Dios, que ton son filato, día tu stavrusu politerma. Christ is of the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon us in the tombs, restoring life. Amen. You have a blessed feast of the ascension. God bless you. A wonderful feast. I hope you all celebrate it deeply. It's a beautiful, beautiful feast.